When people die, it's up to the rest of us who are still here to tell their life stories. That's how they live on. And that's why we call this podcast Immortalized. Welcome back to Immortalized. I'm Steven Siegel from Legacy.com, the world's largest network of obituaries. I'm here today with Linnea Crowther, Legacy's news editor and lead obituary writer. Hi. So Linnea, you spend a big part of your work week writing Legacy's daily tributes to people whose deaths are national headlines, yes? Yes, that's right. And, you know, some of these are definitely famous people, someone whose name you know and face you recognize the second you see it, but not everybody. Uh, uh, Some of the people that we write obituaries for and feature uh, on our national news site are notable for other reasons that might be less flashy, but are really meaningful. Uh, You know, in this past month, I've written obituaries for uh, Olympians, uh, for a Nobel Prize winner some politicians, some actors and musicians who maybe were not huge household names, but had really interesting credits that you would probably know. Uh, Just anyone who I think our readers would be interested in knowing about, I'm going to try to cover them. And that keeps you pretty busy. (laughs) Yes, it does. Like Legacy has published millions of obituaries, but most of those are written one at a time by local families remembering their own loved one. Whereas you might not be so close to the people you're writing about, but you do it every day. Yeah, rarely does a day go by that I am not writing notable obituaries. And we do tend to be pretty busy. And that kind of varies. The the level of busyness varies a little bit depending on the time of year. In summer, we tend to be a little bit slower than in winter because on average, more people die in colder months. But one thing I can tell you for sure is that our news team reported on 44 nationally well-known people who died in the month of July. And every one of those obituaries, in addition to the tribute that you wrote and the memories that you collect from people who are talking about this in news sources around the world, these also all include a guest book on Legacy where anyone can write in and share their own favorite memories or offer condolences to everyone who loved the deceased. That's right. And people always leave messages in those guest books for national newsmakers. Every single one of those 44 obits this past month had condolences and memories left in the guest book. And some of them really had a lot. So today, let's take a look at those. July 2021. How have people been reacting to the news of who died this past month. Here are the obituaries that had the most visitors leaving sympathy messages on Legacy. Um, And we'll go through several of these, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about who these people were and, you know, how people are reacting. Let's do it. Paul Orndorff was the WWE Hall of Famer who was known more popularly as Mr. Wonderful. Tell us about Paul Orndorff. Paul Orndorff, better known as Mr. Wonderful, I think is probably best known in the wrestling world for his on-again, off-again rivalry with Hulk Hogan. Um, They were against each other in some matches, and then they would team up for a while, and then they would have a feud. And uh, I think it was a lot of fun to wrestling fans to watch them, you know, kind of go back and forth like that. And of course, Hulk Hogan is one of the great superstars of the WWE. So being a part of his story um, may, helped audiences really know all about Mr. Wonderful. Uh, later in his life, he was part of a class action suit against the WWE uh, regarding long-term neurological damage in wrestlers, you know, that that uh, d- similar to football, the kind of action that they do can lead to a lot of concussions that can cause that neurological damage. That's interesting. You know, the the one and only time I went in person to a wrestling match was in 1988. My dad took me. I was in middle school. Um, it was WrestleMania four at the Atlantic City Boardwalk. And I, I think that was right after Orndorff uh, had stepped away from the ring for a while because of an injury. Um, but I had certainly watched him on TV in the you know years before that. 
And the drama between him and Hogan, man, it just, it made for such over the top soap opera. It, it was almost like the original reality TV. You know, I found when I was reading his guest book that that people loved him for for kind of different reasons. There were people who loved him because, you know, he was a good looking guy and, you know, he gave them uh, a lot of fun in the WWE. And then there were also people who kind of loved to hate them, maybe because they were a Hulk Hogan fan. And of course, then they're going to hate the guy who has a rivalry with Hogan. So I'll read you just a few entries from his guest book that I found. Here's one. Thanks for the entertainment and memories of wrestling of yesteryear. One of the all-time greatest and most handsome. Which, of course, as I said, you know, Mr. Wonderful had to be a handsome guy. Here's another one. I remember playing college football against Paul when we were both freshmen. He played for the University of Tampa, and I played for Northern Michigan University. The game was played in Tampa in November of 1969. It was their homecoming game. I was surprised when I opened up the newspaper, the Tampa Tribune, the next morning and saw a picture of me tackling Paul. These are some of my very favorite guest book entries for celebrities is when we hear from someone who really had an experience with the person or even knew them in real life. I, I, I love that that brings them kind of down to earth as, you know, they were just people like the rest of us, even though they were celebrities who were beloved. No, absolutely. I, I love that this place where people's lives are being remembered is a place where all of those different threads of the tapestry cross, right? You know, mm -hmm. the, the people who know of you and the people who know you up close, they, they can all come together in this space and share their feelings. Um, and the feelings might be different, but they all sort of circle around what this person's life meant. You know, there's one other kind of thread to that tapestry, too, and that's the people who are just learning about this person because they read the news of their death. And there's certainly plenty of that, uh, you know, where they see a picture that they want to click on and then they learn the story of this person's life and are so moved that they want to sign the guest book. We see a lot of that, too. One more entry that I'll read you from Paul Orndorff's guest book uh, that, that speaks to what I said about him being a heel as well as a, as a beloved wrestler. So Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff, was the first wrestling heel that really scared me. He was the person you loved to boo but had nothing but respect for. He was one of my favorite performers of all time. I wanted him to beat Hogan. Thanks for the countless hours of entertainment, sir. Nice. So another one of the obituaries that received the largest number of sympathy notes uh, this past month was for William Smith, um, who was an actor who may not today in 2021 be a current household name, but who starred in some movies and television that were a big deal uh, back in the 70s, uh, such as the miniseries Rich Man, Poor Man. Yeah, he was a star of the TV Western show Laredo. He was in the Clint Eastwood movie, Any Which Way You Can, and I think a lot of fans really loved their brawl in that movie. And in one of my favorites from the 80s, uh, he played a Soviet colonel in Red Dawn. You know, reading the comments under the obituary, it seems as though William Smith has been one of those actors who maybe left a bigger impression than you might expect from the roles that he played. Yeah, I'll tell you, he was not really someone who was on my radar, although I've certainly seen him in several things. But I learned reading people's comments about him just how important he was to a lot of people. The themes that I was seeing in his guest book were people who thought that he was so handsome and many people who said that he was their all-time favorite actor. One of the entries that I read says, my all-time favorite actor. I saw him in a biker movie, The Losers, as a kid and was hooked. His body of work, screen presence, and villainous portrayals were second to none. Here's another one that, just like in Paul Orndorff's guest book, we had some entries from people who had the chance to interact with William Smith in real life. So here's one. A true gentleman and very nice guy. I met him in Beckley, West Virginia, back in the 70s at the Ramada Inn restaurant cocktail lounge called the Velvet Mine Club that was made to look like the inside of a coal mine. He was in the Beckley area filming an episode of Moving On with Claude Aiken. 
I remember asking him several questions about acting and some of the challenges involved. When I was leaving, I said, I hope I didn't disturb you with all of the questions. And I remember him saying, actually, they were very good questions and I enjoyed talking with you. I told him good night and good luck in your career. And he said, it's always lucky as long as you're keeping the wolf away. <laughs> uh, I love these moments that they're such small moments, kind of quiet little, you know, intimate memories of a day that happened once years mm -hmm. ago. This memory stuck with this person their whole life. Yeah, for more than 40 years. And and I think that part of it is just, I mean, how great is this quote? You would never forget an actor telling you, it's always lucky as long as you're keeping the wolf away. Right. Yeah. So we saw some similar entries, I think, for one of our other most well-responded obituaries of the month, which was Jeff Labar, who was the longtime guitarist for the glam metal band Cinderella. Yeah, Cinderella was one of those bands that on mainstream radio maybe was not quite as big as some of the other glam metal bands back there in the late 80s, but they did have a hit in 1988 with Don't Know What You Got Till It's Gone. And there was actually really sad news for Cinderella in July because they lost not just Jeff Labar, but uh, their keyboardist, Gary Corbett, also died on the same day as Jeff Labar. Oh, wow. That's rough. It was. And I think that not just the band, but a lot of fans really loved Jeff Labar and, and found him to be a super nice guy. I was finding in his guest book that a lot of people were calling him specifically down to earth, which I think is a great compliment when you're talking about a celebrity. Anyone who's going to call a celebrity down to earth had a really nice experience with that person, you know? Absolutely. So here's one, one of his entries says, I've been a longtime fan of Jeff and had many people, including a close friend of his, get me autographs from him, which I will treasure. I finally got to meet him for myself one day at Granite Run Mall. We happened to go there on a weekend when there was a card show going on, and we were heading up the center escalator when I looked back and noticed him standing right in the center. Needless to say, I went right back down and walked up to him and said, you're Jeff Labar from Cinderella? He smiled and said, yes, I am, but I didn't think anyone would know who I was. That's when I introduced myself and told him I'd know him anywhere since I was and have been a huge fan of his. We chatted for a bit and he shook my hand and thanked me. I have to say that he was the sweetest and most humble person I've ever talked to. It will live forever in my heart how sweet he was to take the time with me. You know, you're right. It it really is sort of comforting and reassuring to hear these stories and hear how everyone has the same sorts of feelings of, I'm just a guy, I'm standing here in the corner, what do you mean you know who I am? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So stepping away from rock stars for a moment, one of the other most frequently commented on obituaries that you published this month um, was for Edwin Edwards, who was uh, the four-term governor of Louisiana, um, and he had a really colorful life story. He sure did. Now, you know, Louisiana is a state where you can only serve two terms consecutively as governor, which he did, and then ran again at a later time and was elected, and then ran again at a later time and was elected again. In his early terms, he led the charge to modernize Louisiana's state constitution. He advocated for the state's women and African-American citizens. And then eventually he went to prison for corruption. But after he got out of prison, he ran for the U.S. House of Representatives. And although he didn't win, he managed to get 38% of the vote. Which really speaks to just how many people in his state love this guy if the 10 years in prison weren't enough to, you know, discourage them from bringing him back. Yeah, they were willing to look past that. I actually remember um, when I was in high school uh, was his first comeback as governor. Um, it was the 1991 uh, race and it made national news, which I remember because I didn't know anything about Louisiana, you know, a kid in New Jersey. But I remember the fact that it became a huge story that here was this guy who you would have thought his career in politics was over. And then the opponent that ran against him was a former 
wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. And there was this movement, never mind that he's a crook, we need him <laughs> to beat the racist. Mm -hmm. um, and he won in a landslide. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people were feeling, thank goodness he won in a landslide at that time. And it, it seems like, you know, for for all of that, there are an awful lot of people who came to his obituary to talk about how, from their perspective, he was Louisiana's best governor ever. That was 100% the theme of his guest book. I saw that over and over and over. One entry just, you know, there were a lot of short ones like this. It just says, he was the governor for the people, the best we ever had. Here's another one. My governor, I have never felt this way about a politician that I've never met, and my heart hurts for Louisiana. The love you had for all mankind and for the people in this state was remarkable, to say the least. You loved what you did, fully embraced it with compassion and grace, helping everyone. Wow. People loved this guy. And there were several really great stories told in his guest book of ways that he helped the people in Louisiana. And some of them are very, very long stories. I, I loved reading them. Here's a little bit of a shorter one, though. As governor, he convinced a New York plastics company to locate its next factory in DeRitter, Louisiana. This one routine act by him enabled a quality of life for my family and many others that most families dream of. Years after starting, the CEO told us that the company was planning to locate elsewhere until the day his secretary told him the governor of Louisiana is on the phone. He said it was then that all the plans changed and Louisiana would be selected. I never had the opportunity to thank the governor, but his love of Louisiana changed lives for the better. You know, in a time when everyone is so cynical about politicians, you know, from every possible different political and partisan angle. It's so refreshing, I guess, to read these sort of condolences and remember, oh yeah, despite all of the mess that goes along with politics, there are still people doing real things in office that are really making a difference in the lives of the people around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds like he was a hundred percent one of those people. That brings us to the three most visited obituary guest books from July. And the third of those was for Robbie Steinhardt, who is the violinist and one of the lead singers of Kansas, the symphonic rock band from the 70s and 80s. Yeah, Robbie Steinhardt. I think that for a lot of fans, he's he's kind of the face of the band. He had this amazing hair, this long curly hair. Uh, he was their MC when they would play live. And of course, he played the violin, which really made Kansas stand out. It made them sound, you know, kind of different from the other rock bands at the time. The violin was especially showcased in their hit single, Dust in the Wind, which I have to tell you, after I wrote his obituary, that song was stuck in my head for at least a week. It's resonant, isn't it? A song like that that's mm -hmm. kind of lyrically melancholy and musically just so grand and epic it's it's the sort of thing that you know you you hear it on an occasion like that and it's like wow he he wrote his own tribute didn't he yeah the the theme of a lot of his guest book memories is that uniqueness the the, the his signature sound too here's one in 2002, I had the privilege of meeting him in person as a stage-struck fan, and he was genuinely nice to me. I will always be thankful that I got to tell him that it was his violin that gave Kansas its signature sound. His solo on Nobody's Home is one of the most beautiful ever recorded on any instrument. Now there again, that's someone who, who had an encounter with him and found that he was just this nice guy and really wanted to talk about it. I love seeing that. Right. Here's another guest book entry that I really enjoyed. I have to say this quietly, and you'll know why in a second. Almost every day, I ask Alexa for a Kansas song for me to rock to and sing along as I work in my kitchen. Now I know you might be playing along from up above. It was always such a pleasure listening to you. I don't think that my echo heard me. She didn't start talking out in the other room. Um, but that was that was such a relatable entry. That's, you know, who who doesn't? want to uh, have some good music while they're working in their kitchen. I mean, 
I can tell that you do because <laughs> we're recording the show and you haven't turned yours off. You might be ready to ask for a song right now. As soon as we're done, maybe. <laughs> so speaking of unforgettable songs, the second most visited obituary guest book in July on Legacy was for Biz Markey, the rapper who is probably best known for his 1989 hit, Just a Friend. That song, it's funny and it's so super catchy. And, you know, in 1989, uh, I was I was in late high school and I was this kind of like insufferable alternatine kid who had like no time for anything on the radio. I was too cool for that. Um, but I like unashamedly loved Just a Friend. It, it, how can you not love that song, right? What was it that made this one stick for you? I don't know. It's just so, it's so, it's funny, but it's also really likable and I don't know, kind of relatable. And the video was cute and I don't know, everything about it. I, I don't know how you could not like Just a Friend. But there was more to Biz than just that song. Um, you know, he was a DJ for many years. He recorded a lot of other albums. He did a really fun cameo in Men in Black 2 when he was a, a postal worker who was actually an alien whose native language was beatboxing. And then a new generation got to know him on Yo Gabba Gabba when he did a daily beatbox on Biz's Beat of the Day. That's really something, you know, he's one of these second act people, right? Who, you know, depending on who is paying attention, um, his legacy is is probably two entirely different things to two different generations of Americans. Yeah, we, we did see comments from people who really knew him from Yo Gabba Gabba. Maybe we're too young to have even known about Just a Friend at the time. But you know what I kept seeing in his guest book were people who were his friends in real life. And I kind of got this impression that he was the kind of guy who just collected friends wherever he went, you know? So let me read you a few entries from his guest book. Biz, you made my life better. You inspired me. You made me fall in love with a culture that brought so much for me. Here's another one. There will never be another like him. Biz, I admired your free spirit. You never worried what other people thought. Love your music, and since those very early days, never stopped playing it. Thank you for bringing joy to so many. Here's one from someone who met him in real life. I met Biz in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands in 1999 at Sinbad's Soul Music Festival. He was friendly, funny, and very down to earth. Your music will live on forever. Down to earth. We see it a lot in guest books. There it is again. Yep. And now here's one who, like I said, was a friend in real life. From the time I met you outside of CI High School back in the early 80s, your first shows at the Shirley Armory, Juice Crew shows, spinning your impressive record collection at Jamie's Record Shop in Brentwood, to DJing parties in later years, you always kept it positive and fun. Hip-hop will truly miss your presence in the culture. They're all such sincere, heartfelt condolences. Mm -hmm. They're one of the things I find reading the guest books is... I, I frequently leave them feeling, geez, I, I wish I had known this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that brings us to the obituary that received the most sympathy messages of anyone we wrote about in July. And again, it was a musician. It was a you know rough month for musicians. And this was Dusty Hill, the bassist for the classic rock band ZZ Top. Um, Tell us about Dusty Hill. Well, if you have ever seen a picture or a video of ZZ Top, you probably know that there's the two front men who have these kind of similar enormous beards and they always wore sunglasses and hats in concert. And Dusty Hill was was one of those. And then there's the drummer who did not have the enormous beard. But his name was Beard. His name was Frank Beard. <laughs> is is Frank Beard. He's still with us. Yes. Um. So ZZ Top, you know, started out as these 70s blues rockers from Texas. They had some early hits, uh, LaGrange and Tush, which was a song that Dusty Hill sang uh, in addition to playing bass. And then in the 80s, they kind of took this 
unexpected direction where they embraced the new sound of the new era, started putting synthesizers in their songs, started making funny videos, and became MTV superstars uh, with with a, a handful of great 80s songs like Legs, Gimme All Your Lovin', Sharp Dressed Man, Sleeping Bag. They were huge in the 80s in a way that I think a lot of people didn't really even expect. Yeah, I mean, ZZ Top was one of these bands that it's hard to overstate the degree to which in the early days of MTV, they were MTV. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's hard to think of that era of sort of the crossover between classic rock music from the 70s and new wave and suddenly the explosion of color of MTV videos, like without thinking of these guys right in the front of it. And they were a band that, that really kept on going. Uh, they were playing a concert, uh, I believe, just a few days before Dusty Hill died. Uh, and and I, I believe I've heard that ZZ Top has decided to carry on oh, the wow. music, you know, in, in Dusty's Hill memory, Dusty Hill's memory, and they're going to keep playing. And that was something that I saw a lot in their guest book was people remembering, you know, special memories of ZZ Top concerts because they, they were just a band that was out there for 50 years playing music for their fans. So here's one of many great guest book entries for Dusty Hill. ZZ Top has played a huge role in my life. For 40 years, the music was there through good times, great times, and sadder times. I love singing with Dusty. He had a voice which was just amazing. Singing Tush and playing guitar made me think I was in the band jamming with him. I'm still in shock, tears streaming. It's like losing a family member. That's what he meant to me. R.I.P. Dusty, and thank you for musically being in my life. It was a wonderful 40 years. Wow. The power of art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like losing a family member. Yeah. Those were the obituaries that had the most sympathy messages left this past month. I couldn't help noticing that they were all men this time around, which I have to say seems really odd. It is. And, you know, I don't feel great about it. But here's the thing. It is normal for us to publish fewer news obituaries for women than for men. Uh, I could talk about this for a long time, but the nutshell explanation is, especially for the older generations that tend to be the people who are dying in greater numbers right now, there are just more famous men than there are famous women. Uh, we tend, over a, a long period of time, I've tracked this and found that almost exactly 25% of our news obituaries are for women. This has been exactly the case in 2021 so far. I, I, I looked uh, all the way up until yesterday and we were at exactly 25% women, 75% men. But for July, we only published 20% of our news obituaries were for women. And honestly, it has been a struggle. I've been trying to find interesting, notable women who have died all through July and just haven't found all that many. Sometimes that is just how it shakes out. And it's worth specifying that it's not as though there aren't interesting and notable women who've died. It's that what we're doing in this particular context is reporting on people who are familiar to a national audience. And, you know, at that level, these headlines are reflecting the headlines of decades ago when these people first became famous in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The word notable is just kind of my shorthand to say, you know, interesting and noteworthy to the national audience. Yeah. Well, we will see what those numbers look like next month. Thank you, Linnea. That is our show for today, I think. Thank you also to Legacy.com, where you can now honor a loved one's memory by planting memorial trees in their name. Just visit Legacy.com slash trees. To hear more life stories like these, you can subscribe to Immortalized on your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just look up Legacy.com on YouTube. And if you're on Facebook, you can follow Legacy.com there for daily updates. Thanks for listening. We will catch you on the next Immortalized. Immortalized.